So, you know, alternative names for artificial intelligence might be computational intelligence, um, but because we're doing it with computers, but then, you know, many people believe that what the brain is doing is computational. So computational intelligence is what, you know, animals are doing as well. Uh, I think it's important that, to note nobody here talked about other intelligent beings, really, other than humans. And I think, you know, there's a lot of intelligence in the way that, that non-human animals act. You know, I have, a, I have a dog at home, and I, you know, love him, and I think he's very smart, and, you know, can change his behavior based on external inputs. You know, I give him a treat, and he learns to, you know, go to the door when he needs to be doing it in the middle of my living room. Um, and talk about what AI is through kind of a context of, of history. So, so what has been done in the field, what has been labeled uh, as artificial intelligence, where does this term come from, um, kind of what can artificially intelligent agents do today, what, what are tools that we have in our computers, and then at the end we'll talk a little bit more about what we're actually going to be doing in this course. And today should be pretty freeform and open, uh, you know, I want a lot of input from you, and it's really to help you kind of get a, a good understanding for what we might talk about the rest of the semester, and what we're not going to talk about as well. Okay, so we're going to, to simplify our discussion, we're going to start in the 1940s. If you really want to get complicated, you can go back to, to philosophers like Descartes, who actually talk about beings that have no souls but are intelligent. Uh, and so this, this idea of kind of automata that have intelligence that aren't humans or aren't even, you know, um, animals has, has gone back for a long way. Um, but so one important, you know, initial work was this seminal work from McCullough and Pitts who kind of, uh, who proposed the idea of, of artificial neurons. They did this through programming Boolean circuits. Um, the neuroscientists and, and did a lot of work actually examining humans and, and other animals' brains. Um, a learning rule was, was given for this by Head in 1949, so it's sometimes referred to as, as Hebbian learning. Uh, it's, it's a simple method of, of learning in neural networks. Um, the first computer to actually implement one of these neural networks was 1951, so Marvin Mincy, who's uh, a prominent uh, early, uh, you know, researcher in, in computer in uh, in artificial intelligence, and actually, um, you know, still a professor at MIT, uh, built this as, as part of his PhD work, and you know, it took three thousand vacuum tubes from a from a bomber that you know scrounged after World War II, and it could do a whole forty neurons. Right? And if you, so there is some discussion of machine learning. Did anyone here take the, was in the deep learning seminar last semester? Anyone, anyone familiar with, with deep learning at all? And no, yeah, can I, can you, do you know what the scale of number of neurons that we have in these, these networks are today? Well, if you're talking about like, I, I played around with convolutional neural networks, sure. so if you have an image that's 200 by 200 and you have like three layers of this, each one is considered basically a node, a neuron. And so you, you're coming up to thousands. Yeah, about so the main thing is, is thousands, right? We have, we have on the scale of thousands of these, um, so, so the same idea that you know won't die from 60 years ago is, is been scaled up and we have some actual rigorous math to, to show that some of it actually works now. Um, and so another important work early on is, is this paper from Alan Turing in 1950 called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Um, many of you probably actually know uh, some of the buzzwords from this, whether you actually understand it, it might be a different thing. Um, and it's another paper that is prescient and that it foresaw many problems, uh, but it's also nagged us in, in kind of 
persisting in, in ways it probably shouldn't anymore. So, so what's the main thing from this paper? The main top uh, kind of term that we probably hear a lot in the press when we talk to them? The Turing test, right? And so what is the Turing test? Uh, I, I don't actually know. I mean, the, the way that I've heard it said previously is that you have a computer trying to communicate with a human, and if the human can't tell it's a computer, then it passes. I'm not aware if that's the actual. So that is, so I think this is more or less the, the interpretation of the Turing test that we're given in, in many kind of accounts. Um, it's actually, it's much more specific than that. It is, you know, that they ask these questions, can machines think, and can they think intelligently, right? So the two are not the same. And that this operational test that you referred to as the imitation game, you know, it's just the, uh, you know, uh, let's see, the joke kind of title that, you know, that created this movie that came out, what, a year or two ago. Um, but specifically, there, there's a human interrogator and a human and a, and a computer on the other side of a teletype. So these, um, so this has removed any sort of uh, necessity to, to see a human's face, an artificial face, any sort of expression of, so there's no expression of emotions, kind of in a physical sense. Um, and that you, the interrogator is really supposed to operate with this, with this machine or this human for, for a very long period of time. It's not like a five-minute test. It's, oh, is it fake or is it real? Uh, it, it's really supposed to, to get kind of some deep questions as to, to, to what's going on. Have, have an extensive conversation. Um, you know, Turing predicted that by 2000, there'd be some 30% chance of, of fooling a, a layperson within five minutes. So, you know, that's true to some extent, probably. Um, and, and here is one of the first kind of suggestions as to what AI requires. So, so there's some knowledge, and this has um, played a big role in, in early artificial intelligence up through the, the 80s, and I think there, there might even be a resurgence happening soon, which is how do we represent knowledge in a computational framework? Um, and, you know, kind of what is knowledge versus data versus information, uh, and how sh should a, a, a computational agent that wants to act intelligently uh, have access to this and this story? Um, you know, language understanding is another huge part of, of artificial intelligence, and learning. So learning is a, a fundamental part of, of artificial intelligence, and um, machine learning in, in general Right, we can definitely still consider a subfield of AI. And so what we're going to cover in this course are, are parts of machine learning that aren't covered in your standard machine learning class. And um, to some extent, they're you know, used less often, and that's, that's why they're not in that class. But they, they maybe ask questions that are, that are more interesting at this level of, of reasoning. Uh, and specifically, they're, they're questions about decision making. How, do we, how does an agent learn to, to make better decisions? Um, yeah, but so the, one of the big problems with Turing test is, is you know, it's not hard to understand, is that in no way is it reproducible, and there's no real ability to do mathematical analysis other than, you know, I fooled three out of seven people selected following some semi-random process. Um, I'd like to maybe have a, a better definition of, of what it means to be intelligent. So, Moving forward, you know, in the 50s, computers weren't, weren't very powerful, and so pretty much any time they did any non-trivial task, anything beyond simple, you know, computation of mathematics and, and formulas, uh, people were really impressed. And so, you know, and there is some of the early work prior to artificial intelligence being really defined as a field were on things like playing checkers, um, Nolan Simon at CMU did this, this logic theorist that could do some automatic theorem checking of, of early artificial intelligence. And logic in general uh, was a big initial uh, underpinning of, of AI. And so we're going to spend some time talking about predicate logic and how one can plan and make assertions using, using logical expressions. Um, yeah, 
and then there's uh, some other work on on doing theorem checking with with geometric primitives and, and other things. Um, important to note at the same time, you know, Unimation was founded in 1954, which produced the first programmable robot. It was sold to General Motors, uh, and actually, Dale Engelberger uh, just passed months ago, uh, I believe. So you know, these people are to some extent still with us, and, and really a, a couple of the most important people have really just died in the past few years. So you should think about that in terms of how young it is in the field, and how you know we still have connections to these people, and, and we can. A lot of the newer work we look at, we can trace the lineage directly back to some of these. these are the um, yeah, so 1956 was this kind of the seminal year of artificial intelligence. So there's this uh, DARPA-funded meeting at uh, Dartmouth in New Hampshire, where a lot of the computer scientists working on these kinds of uh, ideas and and came up with the phrase artificial intelligence. Like I said before, there were other names, you know, that potentially could have been used. Um, you know, computational intelligence or computer intelligence were actually explicitly chosen not to be used, partially um, because of Norbert Wiener. Does anyone know who Norbert Wiener is? Anyone ever heard the term cybernetics? You probably heard it. Does anyone know what it means? I don't know what it means, but it means this big book by, not a book, a short book by, by Wiener. And essentially it was, a lot of it was analog computation and, and using physical systems that, uh, that didn't have kind of digital uh, processing. And so part of the reason artificial was chosen was explicitly to, to allow this broader view of what uh, you know, machine intelligence could be or intelligence that was not natural. And so, so John McCarthy, uh, who was one of the people who attended this meeting, you know, two years later, in, developed the Lisp programming language, which you know, is still widely in use today. The only other programming language, kind of general purpose language that's used often is Fortran, and you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, most of them aren't because it's a good language, but because code is written in it. Uh, whereas there are a lot of people who will tell you that Lisp is the one true language and anyone using anything else doing it incorrectly, particularly in, in AI. Um, we're not going to use it. So we're going to use Python because it's barrier to entry is much lower. And I have code that helps. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, so the, the other point here, so, so is anyone familiar with the ELISA program? Or as a so what what is it? You're nodding. Um, oh yeah, it's like a it's like a psychiatrist type. Yeah, chatbot. it's kind of like a, a psychoanalyst where you type in and it, it responds, and it's uh, one of the first attempts at, at solving the Turing test. Um, and, and we'll look in a second at some of the problems with the way it worked and kind of give a skeleton of how. It just a little bit more about this Dartmouth conference. Um, so here is the explicit, you know, funding statement proposed that a two-month, ten-man study of artificial intelligence be carried out during the summer of 1986 at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. The study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate. Okay, and so. We see that this definition is somewhat different than what we were saying. So it's got two parts. One is right, there's a that we want to distill the processes of intelligence and learning down to some principles that are programmable. And then that another that our um, and I would claim that the way that we're going about doing artificial intelligence today, and, and kind of some of the most um, successful examples of it, do not do this at all. In no way do they, are they informed by the, the literature on, on neurophysiology or neuroprocessing, and uh, you know, to the extent that our neural network is an artificial neural network, 
is, uh, you know, what we have in deep learning is nothing like what's actually happening in your brain or in your spine or in your arm. For that. Um, these are, uh, are very different systems. Um, and retelling some of that, so Alan Newell, Arthur Samuel, Herb Simon, or all other uh, early uh, players in this area. And I think, so one distinction that we can make about this idea of simulating or in really reproducing human intelligence, it kind of gets back to this idea earlier of, of self-awareness, is this distinction between what we might call weak AI and strong AI. Okay? Is that, has anyone heard these terms before? So what, what's then the difference? Well, you know, weak AI is basically what's happening now is that it's any kind of sensitive decision-making about it that else sci-fi idea of the game machine. Yeah, that's some of it. I mean, so what do we, when, a, when an airplane is in the air, moving safely, what do we say it's doing? Okay, no. the, 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 let's say a human is, is at the controls. What is the airplane itself doing? Fly, okay. Uh, when a submarine is underwater, going from one continent to another, what does it do? It's submerged in swimming. <laughs> We don't call it swimming, but uh, you know, I don't think anyone on board that submarine is going to claim that what they're doing isn't you know, safely moving under the water. Uh, so you, know, you could call that some, the equivalent of, of what weak AI might be, right? That you, you're achieving the task you care about achieving through whatever means you, you're using, and you don't really care if how it's working is any semblance of what's the true uh, you know, intelligence is to solve that task in a human or some other animal. Whereas strong AI is, is kind of this notion that you have a self-aware, um, fully conscious agent that's acting in, in a way at least similar to the way that, that another you know, intelligent creature would address this problem. Yeah. And so in 57, Herb Simon, um, Intelligence, it's not my to surprise to talk to you, but the simplest way I can summarize it is to say that there are now in the world machines that think, that learn, and that create. Moreover, their ability to do these things is going to increase rapidly into a visible future, and the range of problems they can handle will be coextensive with the range of which human minds have been applied. More precisely, within 10 years, a computer will be able a chess champion, an important new mathematical theorem will be proved by a computer. Were either one of these things come true? Yes? 67? Did they come true in 67? No. no. More like, you know, 97. 40 years later, not, not 10. Um, and, yeah, so these guys were super excited when they came up with this idea. Um, but the problem seemed deceptively easy. And it's proved time and time again that these problems are much more difficult to solve than we think they are. Yeah. So they came through, yeah, approximately 40 years from 10. Um, in 57, though, Simon did have an automatic translation machine to go from Russian to English. Uh, here's a great example of going from English to Russian and back, where the original English is the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And through this translation, we get the Translation that the vodka is strong, but the meat is rotten. <laughs> <laughs> so, very yeah. poetic. <laughs> you know, semantics have changed somewhat, even if the syntax is correct and, and kind of a direct mapping from word to word. <laughs> and so, uh, this is sometimes referred to as, as the semantic gap. So, kind of how do we you know, create all this? Other context that's apparent to us when we read this sentence that you know spirit and flesh are meant as kind of this dichotomy in some sense of, of what a human is, and not uh, alcohol and, and body. Um, so back to Eliza, um, it was essentially a rule-based system that had a lot of knowledge put in by humans. So if it parsed the word mother, 
it would respond with, tell me more about your family. Trying to just elicit more answers. And it's, and it's trying to just use your own, you know, uh, kind of ego and a desire just to talk about yourself to trick you into thinking that it cares. Um, but what if we hear this sentence, I wanted to adopt a puppy, but it's too young to be separated from its mother. Um, and then Eliza comes and responds, tell me about your family. Uh, you know, there's a big, again, semantic gap in the meaning of the, the role that mother plays in the sentence uh, from kind of the, the more typical use. And so the, the observations that kind of came from this are that there needs to be some understanding about the world. There needs to be some stronger uh, contextualization in, in how the world is working. And that additionally, to solve some of these problems, we need computationally tractable ways. Um, you know, NP completeness is a problem for solving a lot of the simple problems. Problems that can be stated very simply in terms of artificial intelligence, and you know, we get exponential growth in terms of requirements of data if we do things as well. Um, an interesting, you know, another thing to state is sometimes we actually refer to concepts as not being NP-complete, but being AI-complete. Uh, and there's not, so, there's not, you know, a rigorous technical definition for that, but what, does anyone have a, want to venture a guess as to what AI-complete means? Like it would be uh, as challenging as making a sentient something. Is it, essentially, right? Is that to solve the, the small problem you, you want to describe, it actually ends up if you solve that, you solve all of artificial intelligence. Right? And this is often a problem with young graduate students. They come in and they're excited about solving some problem, and then once you kind of get a little bit, you realize that you have to solve all of human level understanding. Uh, okay, so continue our history now. Uh, like I said before, knowledge-based approaches kind of took over in the 70s. Uh, yeah. um, 1970 also, we saw Shaky at, at SRI, which was kind of the first intelligent robot. Yeah. So a lot of the things we been, like the, the research in deep learning, would that have been, would people have thought that was AI complete like a few years ago? Um, no. No? no. Okay. I mean, so what, what, what do you think? I don't know, like recognizing something in a picture. Yeah, so, so recognizing something in a picture, um, there's a, but if it's simply, I give you labels, yeah. Uh, pictures of dogs in the center of them, and yeah. there's a dog in the center of a picture. You can say it's a dog. Yeah. I don't think we think it's that. Okay. We'll talk. We'll talk a little bit about vision. And, okay. Um, uh, right. So Shaggy was this awesome robot that had a TV camera and drove around and pushed blocks and de like developed kind of some of the first real planning algorithms. Um, both in terms of logical planning and, and motion planning. Um, and it's actually sad when we go to, I'm a roboticist, and I'll go to robotics conferences, and we'll see papers that still can't really do some of the things that Shaky did, but have all they so much better. Uh, and so it's, it's this very inspiring story, and it's also extremely depressing sometimes that you, you've been working for, you know, 45 years since then, and we still can't uh, really improve upon it in some ways. Um, in the 80s, we saw this idea of expert systems, um, which were essentially databases that had some reasoning and all these little experts working in them. And this, there are tons of companies that got founded to create these expert systems, and they were, people were super excited about them. Uh, you know, the government was giving tons of money to AI research because of this, and then they uh, totally busted out in the late 80s. And we got what was called the AI winter, where it was very difficult because they thought it was all just you know, nerds tinkering in their labs and not making any real progress on anything that would be useful to society. Um, 
But another very important thing in 1988 uh, is this paper from Rod Brooks called Elephants Don't Play Chess. Okay. And so does anyone know who Rod Brooks is? Rodney Brooks? Does anyone own a Roomba? But you all know what it is, yeah? Yes. So, so Rod Brooks founded iRobot. Uh, more recently, he founded Rethink Robotics, uh, which has this Baxter robot, which we have, you know, because it, it pretty much sums up the point. And, and what might that be? AI does what it's good at. Or um, something that uh, is able to solve a problem well isn't necessarily like uh, human, even though humans can solve it well. Right, right. Um, so maybe another another interesting paper from from Brooks is you know alternate ideas, right? And so it's that elephants are quite intelligent, but they they don't play these games. We, AI researchers have been putting it kind of the center of their research for you know the past thirty years, and that they're uh, things like walking which elephants do very well, uh, are actually extremely difficult to do and require large amounts of, of intelligence, uh, but just not the kind of intelligence that humans might be as impressed by because it's an intelligence that almost all of us have. Um, and there's some really, there's a few quotes in this paper I just wanted to pull out, you know. In this paper, we argue that the symbol system hypothesis upon which classical AI is based is fundamentally flawed, right? So this is, you know, the symbol system hypothesis is essentially that all knowledge as as discrete little logical labels, and you just labels enough that you can solve intelligence. Okay. Um, and so Brooks goes farther than just claiming that the kinds of problems we're working on are wrong. He actually claims that the methods we're using to solve them are wrong, and it's informed and you know generally converge on those ideas because of um, the problems we're looking at. And so the, you know, the new AI is based on the physical grounding hypothesis. This hypothesis states that to build a system that is intelligent, it is necessary to have its representations grounded in the physical world. Um, and so this can be summarized as saying intelligence needs to be well situated, right? It needs to not simply exist in a computer system, uh, but it needs to with the outside world in some way to have an understanding of and have some form of intelligence. Um, you know, there's no examples of, of humans existing without any sort of sensory information or emotion and displaying any form of intelligence, right? All, all the examples of intelligence we have operate in a world where they're constantly receiving sensory information, you know, even if you're blind and deaf, you still have you know, tactile sensing and proprioceptive sensing of where your body is and, and all these sorts of um, ways of interacting with the world. Um, and you know, the majority of, of artificially intelligent systems up to this point had none of these. Uh, and Brooks is now going to define what what he calls the behavior-based robotics or the behavior-based intelligence paradigm, which is that the this new AI based its decomposition of intelligence into individual behaviors, uh, which when we combine them, create you know a larger, more complex behavior. So if you have some very simple um, uh, ideas of you know I bump a wall, I'm gonna stop walking in that direction and walk along the wall until I get to a corner, you can combine that with some other simple behaviors and, and generate a rather um, complex agent in terms of this. Um, and, and Brooks pushed this idea for a long way, and there's some more formal versions of it, but like everything else we've talked about, this kind of the pendulum swung too far in this direction, and we needed to come back from just these low-level, bottom-up behaviors and think again about top-down information. And how that developed 
starting in the late 80s was with uh, statistical operations. So, so one of the main problems of knowledge-based systems and kind of logic-based systems is that things are true or false. Um, there's no uncertainty encoded in it. And you know, probability gives us the tools we need to encode uncertainty in a, in a formal way. Uh, and so this is kind of where what we're going to talk about in the class really, really picks up for the third majority of the class. And that, that is you know, probabilistic methods for, for performing decision making under uncertainty. And you know, more recently, these, with even faster computers and the internet, we've been able to get tons of more data and, and extend these kind of basic, basic approaches to, to very complex domains and, and lots of uh, interesting new problems. And instead of kind of giving a detailed history of this, we're going to start looking at some, some different examples. So, we're going to do a quiz, which is what, what can AI do today? So I'm going to put up a question, and if you think there's some AI system that can solve this problem, you know, show your enthusiasm for that answer, whatever way you choose. So, uh, so play a decent game of table. Minority opinion. I say it's true. Uh, yes. Definitely can't. Robust robots that can do this. Um, the best ones, in my opinion, is where I did my postdoc. Uh, they have a great one. It's, it's very good. This uh, can definitely beat me, but I'm, I don't know if it can. It's not going to be very competitive against you know, uh, professional players, but it can keep its own for a while. Can uh, you know an AI system drive safely along a curved mountain road? Yeah. 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 What weather condition? Okay. <laughs> Driving safely. So so I am without any sort of uh, yeah modifiers here. We can say yes. You know, there's autonomous cars have actually you know done the Pikes Peak race now. Um, can a car drive safely from here up to Alta? Like today. Okay. Don't do so, uh, I'm going to claim no. So, uh, yeah, so snow destroys, like Google's car, um, from what I've heard from, from a few different people, uh, you know, it requires very good maps uh, from GPS and needs to know more or less exactly where the curb is on the street. And be able to localize to that using its laser. And if there's a big pound, you know, mound of snow on top of that curb, it's completely confused, doesn't know where it is, and it's just sucks. Uh, so, you know, some people have said we're going to have these cars, you know, in all our driveways in ten years. Quite a bit more skeptical of that, but you know, I'm happy to be proved wrong. You think we can have a system buy a week's worth of groceries on the internet? Yeah, yeah, that's done. That's easy. Can it go to Smith's and buy the same week's worth of groceries? No, you're going to get all kinds of weird stuff. It's going to have shaky go and try and pick out an orange. <laughs> yeah, it's going to not be able to find anything and, and, and drop half of them and your rice is going to be spilled in a long line down the aisle. Um, discover and prove a new mathematical theory. Okay. Saying <laughs> recent headlines about this, but um, but what does it mean to prove something? This isn't like a rhetorical question, it's a real question. <laughs> it means to show a rigorous set of steps from some axioms to uh, proof that some statement is true. Okay, so that's how we write a proof, definitely correct. Um, but is that all a proof is? No, there is a lot of inherent understanding around it, and 
there's a question about what is worth proving, um, as well as like, for example, you have the four color theorem, which technically they proved it, but it was through massive enumeration, so they're like, yeah, of, it has to be understandable by a human, and they're not as good as that. Right, so I think, I think that's exactly right, and, and even when humans, you know, propose proofs, as you know, we get often some <coughs> Right, so as he's proved, you know, p equals n p, uh, but do we believe it immediately? Right, no, we're not going to. Right, to, to write a proof means you actually have to convince someone else that what you have proved to yourself is true, and and more broadly, it really requires a consensus um, in a community to for this to really become a theorem, and so the. Maybe computers have proved these, but to my yeah, been a, decided by the community as being a, a So conversing successfully with another person for about an hour, say, yeah, maybe, I'm going to say no. Uh, I get, whenever I go and play with these chatbots that win things, I get really annoyed. What do you yeah. mean by successfully? I mean, that's the question, right? Like, there are people who can talk to, like, Eliza for an hour, but... Yeah, so I guess in this sense, successfully would be, you know, fooling us that it's actually a human and not a good question. Uh, so, so, defining success is, is always important to me. Uh, yeah, successes. Perform a complex surgical <laughs> operation. Clear. Yeah. Alright, Jackson, I'm going to put you on the cutting table. Because I, I mean, so it's being overseen <laughs> by someone else. So there has been some autonomous suturing um, and like kind of small skills that have been kind of learned from human demonstration that robots can repeat, but performing the entire operation, uh, I, don't, I don't know of anything on that. Give it another 40 years. What? Another 40 years. Another 40 years. Okay. So unloading a dishwasher and putting everything away. <laughs> I would need to see that paper, like, <laughs> what I work on. <laughs> one or two plates put into a drying rack, or one or two plates lifted and put into a shelf. But, uh, but a really complicated dishwasher, opening the door, pulling it out, putting everything away in the right place. Um, I think it's, it's that something that, you know, definitely in 40 years, I would, we should have, and probably, yeah. But is that because no one really works really hard at getting it to do that? Uh, people, people, no, definitely people work on this problem. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's because it's a really hard problem. Um, that there's so much variation from scene to scene, and you know how cups, one cup looks different than another, even though they're very similar. Uh, it's very hard for the method to be kind of deal with this, this explosion. But yeah, there are people working brain projects. This is like one of their key problems they want to solve. Uh, what about translating spoken Chinese into spoken English in real time? Mandarin or Cantonese? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so this is done. So Microsoft has an amazing system that uses deep learning and does this. Um, and it's, it's awesome. Have similar results as that English Russian English thing you had earlier? Uh, it's, it's slightly better. Uh, <laughs> But there's, there are more, that's still available in machine translation in general. So what about writing an intentionally funny story? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know about a story, but I do. He asked his friend, Irving Bird, where some honey was. Irving told him there was a beehive in the oak tree. Joe walked to, an, to the oak tree. He ate the beehive. <laughs> <laughs> Another good one is, Henry Squirrel was thirsty. He walked over to the river bank where his good friend Bill Bird was sitting. Henry sipped and fell in the river. Gravity drowned. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, so the last example from here is, once upon a time there was a dishonest fox and a vain crow. One day the crow was sitting in his tree holding a piece of cheese in his mouth. He had cheese. He became hungry and swallowed the cheese. The fox walked over to the crow. 
Sli slightly different parable than what ASOS taught us. Uh, but nevertheless, entertaining. Um, so this was, you know, 30 years ago this happened. Uh, this is an awesome paper that is from just a couple of years ago uh, that actually makes intentionally funny jokes. It's called Unsupervised Joke Generation from Big Data. Uh, it uses probabilistic models of language to, to generate jokes of the form, I like my X like I like my Y, Z, right? And so there's a few examples that they could not find you know, anywhere on the internet, and these are all you know, derived from their model um, that automatically came up with them just from looking at tons and tons of, of text on the internet. And having you know, this joke model as a probabilistic uh, graphical model, which is something we'll talk about later. So the first example is, I like my relationships like I like my source, open. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another good one is, I like my coffee like I like my war, cold. <laughs> and I like my boys like I like my sectors, bad. <laughs> so obviously, you know, this is large computer scientist uh, data. <laughs> and those, these are classified funny jokes. These were, so they did a lot of human so, studies. Yeah. And yeah. so human jokes were funny 33% of the time, and their computer jokes were rated funny 16%. So <laughs> yeah. the low baseline, you know, is, is telling. But, uh, <laughs> but this was a fun little paper. Um, so more broadly, right, natural language is, is this huge area of artificial intelligence. And some people would claim that solving NLP, natural language processing, is, is an AI complete problem. If you can give a complete description of, of language, you can allow a computer to solve any you care to have. Um, I, I would disagree because I think you can tell me how to throw a 150 mile, you know, 105 mile per hour fastball, and I'm not going to be able to do it. Right? So like, there's a difference between knowledge. Uh, knowledge of and knowledge how. Um, and, and NLP is very much concerned with this problem of, if, it can, if we solve language, we can solve a number of problems that just require uh, the understanding of things or, or what things are made of. Um, and so certain you know, versions of this are things like speech recognition, uh, text-to-speech synthesis, and, and more broadly, just dialogue systems that are doing both of these. Uh, so machine translation is something we talked about earlier, um, but also extracting from written documents or retrieving uh, documents that might answer questions or speaks to a computer uh, or other versions, um, you know, classifying these documents for, for storage or spam filtering. These are all kind of things that are falling into this category. Uh, and so just here's another machine translation. So does anyone speak French? Nobody speaks French at all. My French is pretty terrible. I, I learned from a Belgian woman in German whose German was worse than mine. <laughs> uh, so this long sentence actually gets a, a pretty good translation. Of according to the president, the commission would be able to do so. Uh, this sentence is another kind of strange one, which is, we must blood in the veins and the courage. Kron uh, actually means guts, not not courage, um, and so it, it means that he, we have uh, blood in our veins, in our guts. Um, okay. And so we're not going to, so these are, that's an area we're not going to really talk about for the rest of the semester. So there's other classes on NLP, there's people who know way more about it than I do, um, and you should you know, take their classes if you're interested in that. So computer vision is an area I do know a lot about, but we're also not going to cover in this class, because there's another class being taught this semester on this. Um, but it is important to talk about maybe the different kinds of questions that we might want to ask uh, about you know, images, uh, or more broadly, have visual questions. Two examples of images here, and below are what we call semantic segmentation. Right? So we're going to, a segmentation is a breaking up of the scene components into its constituent members. And this one is semantic because it applies to it some labels. Right? Um, so we can see on the left that there is this 
person whose body is in front of, is on top of grass and next to road, below the sky and the tree. On the right, similarly, we have an airplane. And so one question we might care about asking, and this is definitely the question that you know, is, to some extent, is, saw, is, is, is very good progress on in terms of deep learning, is there a person, is there an airplane in this, in this picture? Uh, and that question, in the deep learning sense, uh, they're just answering a yes-no question. They're not even giving this sort of labeling of where that person is. Um, there are some methods that you know, require some pre-processing and post-processing with deep learning in the middle, and they can achieve this type of result um, to some extent. But there are other visual questions you might ask, right? Um, for example, the person is standing on the grass, right? And so here they're, we already, we're putting verbs in. There's some action, you know, standing. It's not a very exciting action. Um, but it is now relating between multiple elements in the scene. Uh, more, even more, you know, broad questions to, to answer would be, is the person standing? Questions. Uh, Similarly, we could say the airplane is not flying, right? It's sitting, it's sitting on this grass. Um, this might lead us to ask, is the airplane broken, right? Can, can we identify that visually, right? Or, uh, and, and along with these kind of semantic questions, there are still you know, physical questions that we care about answering and looking at, at scenes. Like, you know, what is the 3D position of this woman you know, in relation to me so I know if I can you know, hand her an apple, if I'm a nice apple-picking robot? Or if I need to shoot her, if I'm a mean robot who wants to not let people into wherever I'm, I'm stored. Um, so vision is, is this huge, exciting area, and you know, uh, there's a class being taught on it right now, and, and I you know, definitely recommend you take it if you're at all interested. Okay. Robotics, I'm just going to do a slide. There's a ton of stuff with robots. Um, you know, part of it's AI, part of it's engineering, part of it's cursing a lot and hoping things work. Uh, so we've seen, you know, there's game playing like soccer that's done by robots. Um, we've seen autonomous vehicles, you know, they're all over the place in the news now. Uh, other, other areas of the DARPA Robotics Challenge this last summer, and that's really aimed at, at robots for, for search and rescue operations or, or other disasters. And there's tons of automation in, in the factory setting. Uh, so for these kind of robot soccer games, autonomy is huge there. They work in autonomous systems, they coordinate with each other. Uh, these are some of the, the best examples of kind of multi-agent systems actually doing things um, autonomously that, that are you know, artificial agents. For things like search and rescue at the you know, Dark Robot Challenge, there was practically zero autonomy. Uh, I mean, the robots could, to some extent, balance on their own. They could sometimes plan their footsteps on their own, but oftentimes uh, in, in So someone who worked on this, who is a huge guy in machine learning, uh, Christopher Atkinson, he said the biggest problem with the dark robotics challenge and was that interfaces for human-robot interaction were, were terrible. But this was the, the biggest, the weakest link in there, and that we need to work on that before we even think about it, if we want real systems to operate. Um, which is quite telling, since he's someone you know, who's been working on reinforcement learning since the late 80s. Okay. So, you know, I care deeply about robotics, and a lot of our motivation for this class will be kind of robotics inspired. Uh, this I mentioned earlier that logic is a is a big uh, a big part of AI. Um, so theorem provers were a big part of early AI. Um, NASA uses logic based systems to do fault diagnosis on their systems. These are these are awesome systems. They have logic based planners running on all kinds of satellites and rovers. Um, you know, logic based systems do work for question answering to some extent. Uh, especially if it's kind of structured knowledge about uh, you know, achieving some or there's like a limited number of, of states and you just 
want to query it to understand what is its current state, how can we, how can we use it. Um, and so, so some of the most important methods in here are, I think, are problems like constraint satisfaction, which is a problem we'll, we'll spend a couple of days talking about, um, and satisfiability solvers, which kind of touch on yeah, some, some theoretical um, computer science topics. And there's been a lot of advances uh, over the past you know, decade or two. So another really big part of AI that you know did finally get solved right 40 years or 30, uh, after it was talked about was playing chess, uh, right? And so Deep Blue played and claimed that intelligent creative play. It was processing 200 million board positions per second, um, and humans understood most of what Deep Blue was doing. Uh, and yeah, we can get similar performance with much smaller computers now, uh, but in no way is the way that this computer was solving chess the way a human is solving. Um, and yeah, so there's, so there's questions about how, how does human cognition deal with this massive search space to, to be able to compete still with these systems that can simulate tons and tons of that's differently, you know, how can humans just compete with these systems? And, and there's actually a huge problem in, in competitive chess play now of cheating. That um, there's, there's research being done on identifying is a player playing, you know, as you would expect them to play against another ranked player, or are they having, you know, do they have someone in the audience signaling to them in some way what moves to make, who has a, you know, cell phone in his pocket attached to a you know, small cluster somewhere that's solving all of these stuff. Uh, because, you know, this was 20 years ago, and, and computers are even better now at chess. Um, ridiculous. Uh, but so interesting is, right, there were actually two matches that Kasparov in terms of, so first in 96, and he won, and he said, I could feel, I could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table. He thought this was awesome. Then, because he won. What? Because he won. Because he won, exactly. So when he loses, he's just, Deep blue had <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, unsurprising of someone who would make these kinds of statements who later became a politician. So. <laughs> uh, so, other interesting things in game playing, um, there's a really interesting in two, there's a program called TD Gamut that you use a neural network attached to a reinforcement learning algorithm that will play competitively with um, uh, professional players. And that was a learning-based system, unlike Deep Blue, which was entirely kind of a search-based planning system. Uh, more recently, checkers has been solved. So given any state in a checkers game, there is a known best action to take to, to win the game or, or to minimize your um, another big area for game playing currently is poker. Uh, and in particular, it's hold up with limits, computers do very well. Uh, with no limits, it becomes much uh, because they don't have as many constraints to operate within. But uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting work in, in, in card playing. Um, so, you know, you probably shouldn't gamble against computers. There's a good chance they're going to beat you, and, uh, and they don't have any tells. They just play on the pot box. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, decision making from AI has actually been used in a lot of areas now. And so, while, you know, maybe our dreams of fully autonomous intelligent systems don't exist, there are a lot of applications with that, that use them. So route planning on Google Maps uses some variant of A star search and does a very good job of that. You know, it helped me get to Provo and back no problem yesterday. Um, you know, more broadly scheduling is a huge important area in industry for, for making efficient, uh, large scale systems work. 
and you know, the list goes on. Uh, medical diagnosis is, is one that's really interesting. There's, there's a lot of work going on right now, right? So, I guess the one thing, right? Yeah, the other thing I didn't talk about for game playing, right, is Watson, right? So, who watched Watson play Jeopardy four or five years ago? Yeah? Anyone? Who, who doesn't know what I'm talking about? You get that? Okay. So, IBM made a supercomputer that played Jeopardy and, and beat the pants off Ken Jennings. Uh, so, it was hilarious. When you do like the double Jeopardy or whatever and you choose to bet money, uh, it was like, I bet $430 and 12 cents. Yeah! That makes, okay. <laughs> we, you will understand why I did that at the end of this class because it was simply computing its utility, and that was the one that maximized its, its you know, the maximum utility was to do. Um, yeah, so they made a supercomputer, it played Jeopardy, and it was fun. Importantly, you know, it was being sent the messages over Ethernet. It did not listen to Alex Salem. So, uh, there's a big difference between those two things. Uh, it also answered a final Jeopardy question where it said a United States city gave the name of a city in Canada. So there is definitely something going wrong there. Uh, <coughs> but IBM has since taken this technology and developed it actually to, to look at large uh, volumes of medical records to, to help with diagnosis and, and trying to determine, help doctors um, examine all this data that they have to look at now. Um, and that's you know, a very important area moving forward that, that a lot of healthcare professionals think is, is a way to, to improve our, our health system now that we know about so many more diseases. So now we can ask again, what is, what is AI? And we could, we're going to define it this way. If we'd like, we can simplify that to saying machines that think rationally or act, like, act rationally. Right? And, and we know humans don't you know, act rationally all the time. We know they don't think rationally. You know, um, in terms of, and I'm not just saying this in kind of a cheeky way about, oh yeah, you know, he's being irrational. You know, there's concrete studies from economists that humans make the wrong decisions about their money when presented with, with rational, uh, they don't choose the rational answer um, in very concrete ways, similar in using utility theory, which is what we're going to use uh, to discuss here. So rational decisions. Does anyone know where the word rational comes from? No idea. What is, what is the, the root of this word? Ration. Ration. Ratio. 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 Okay. And that's more or less exactly what rational means. I mean, thinking of, of ratios. The, the Latin ratio right, is a reckoning or calculation for reason. Okay. And so it's a calculating decision. It's going to be cal explicitly calculated. It's not some hard-coded rule-based system necessarily, but it, it's going to, to compare possible answers. In a particular way, that it's going to be a rational agent one is that maximizes achieving And we're only going to concern what decisions are made. We don't care at all about the thought process behind how the decisions are made. Right? So we're going to take you could call the, we'll be, we'll be in the weak AI camp, but we just care about having these agents perform uh, such that they achieve the, the maximum we expected uh, yeah, reward. The goals we're going to express are in terms of the utility of their outcomes, so what, how much, so this is said differently, how much reward does our agent get conditioned on which outcome it achieves, being to maximize your goals, you're going to maximize your expected utility. And it might be better to call this class actually computational rationality, since it's going to be you know, the main goal we're going to be striving towards. And okay. That being said, we will probably take a day at the end to more formally look at, at some of the philosophical underpinnings of AI and, and the ethics 
uh, questions that surround it. Um, because I think it's important, you know, in all fields we work in to, to really discuss the ethics, uh, but also I think it's it's important to combat some of the fear mongering that's being by otherwise intelligent people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. Who... Okay, so take this, remember this, maximize your expected utility. It's going to be what we care about doing this month. Yeah. Um, so in terms of maximizing our expected utility, in the case where we have like a greedy algorithm that doesn't perform optimally, do we say that each greedy decision is not uh, rational, or if we chose the, yeah. or, sorry. So basically, are we looking at the grander goal and saying that if, even if we don't perform rationally at each step, that we're rational at the end, or are we rational at each step, so we must be rational at the end? So in general, it's going to be the long-term expected. So, so it's going to, yeah, reason about long periods of time, or this greedy step. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see that greedy algorithms, or algorithms that use some form of greedy help uh, can be made to, to do close to optimal. Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, I think the last thing we're gonna talk about real quick is we want our agents to be rational. And so what do people think of when they hear agents? The word agent. Not in this class. You're out anywhere. You hear the word agent. That's the matrix. Some kind of entity that has the ability to make decisions on behalf of someone. Okay, you're being a okay. nerd. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. You don't think of like James Bond? Or like uh, the Matrix. Oh, the Matrix, James. right? Yeah. So what are these agents doing in all of these cases? Investigating. They're investigating? That's, that's part of it. Does your travel agent investigate? I guess so. <laughs> <All right. laughs> It's a good way I haven't thought of that word. <laughs> no, it's, it might, it might work. Um, but importantly, right, they're operating on their own, right? They're not being controlled by someone else directly. They're interacting with the world. They're taking sensory information in and changing their decisions based on that. Um, yeah, we can say they're invest, we'll investigate if we're trying to, we'll call it exploration. Not as fancy, but it's some entity that proceeds and acts, right? And there's some environment you might call it the world, uh, and the agents, you know, receive sensory information from it. There's a big question mark, and that's what we need to figure out. And then it applies some action um, to the world, and to you know, may or may not change the state, and that may or may not be in a way that's good or bad. So then a rational agent is one that selects its actions that are going to maximize its utility function. Um, and so what that utility function is, is, is really important, right? So we can take any behavior we observe and claim it's rational, right? So by simply finding the function that is maximized by performing that behavior, it's still a rational behavior. So, and that's how we get the right utility function is, is a really hard problem that there's not really an answer for. And so we're just going to be given that in the most part. Um, right, and so certain characteristics of, of the sensory percepts, the environment, and the space of actions are going to dictate uh, which techniques are best for the for an agent to use for actions. And so this course is going to be about you know general AI techniques that can be used for, and then what you as a student in the class are supposed to learn is not only what these techniques are and how to, but when you should apply them, and, and how you can look at characteristics of a problem to understand what might be the right method to use. And we can roughly break the course into, into three sections. Uh, the first part is about making decisions when we know about the world without much uncertainty. Okay. So we look at search, logic, planning with logic, uh, and some gameplay. We're also going to then we're going to look at sequential decision making where there is some uncertainty in it out. 
So these are going to be using Markov decision processes. It's kind of the, the underlying uh, model. And we'll look at doing reinforcement learning with this. And we'll also look at, at hidden Markov models, which are a different sequential model of where you're trying to identify an underlying unknown state. Uh, both MDPs and HMMs are, are specific versions of what we call uh, probabilistic graphical models. Uh, and so we're going to look at, at, at Bayes, Bayesian networks or Bayes nets and, and PGMs more broadly. Uh, and also look at decision theory and how they relate to in more broadly than just sequential decision making, uh, performing reasoning. And this will also include an extension of MDPs to, to what we call POMDPs, where our agent doesn't have full information about its world, but only sensory information that is partial in terms of. And so that's all I have for today. We stretch it just the right amount. Um, happy to take any questions. And I do have office hours today at like 3. If people need to come and talk one on one about it. I would. Yeah, so these slides will go up um, after class.